part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a man called Tim and a woman called Laura discussing preparations for their holiday. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Our plane tickets arrived this morning. It reminded me how much there is to do before we go. Let's write everything down, shall we, so we don't forget anything? Yes. And last time we went away, we almost forgot to collect our currency from the bank. So let's start with that. Good thinking. And wasn't there an appointment you said you'd got to cancel? Yes, the hairdresser. Thanks for reminding me. Can you write that down too? The shop will be closed now, but I'll do it first thing on Monday. OK. Then starting on Tuesday, we've got to take the tablets we got from the pharmacy. We really mustn't forget to do that. We're not protected against malaria till we've been taking them for at least seven days. No, so that's really important. And what about shopping? There's still a few things we've got to buy the next time we're in town. We need some more sunblock, don't we? We've only got that Factor 10 stuff. It won't be strong enough. I've already bought that. But what we do still need to get is sunglasses. The ones I've got aren't good enough, and I don't think yours are either. OK, I've noted that down. And I think I'm going to get another bag too, just a small one. We always seem to come back with more things than we take. <laughs> Should we get an extra lock for our suitcase as well? Just in case the one we've got breaks. They don't seem to last long. Yes, they are a bit flimsy. OK, right. Oh yes, and we need an adapter for our electrical things. Your hair dryer and my shaver. The plugs on them are bound to be the wrong type. We could get one at the airport. They always have them there. Well, I'd rather get it beforehand, so I'm writing it down. And then I think that's it, isn't it? I think so, as far as shopping's concerned. But we also need to order a taxi to take us to the airport. We should do that well in advance. My sister left it too late and she had to take the train with that huge suitcase of hers. I know, she really struggled with it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, let's see. Your mother said she'd come in regularly while we're away. So what do we want her to do? I'll write some instructions and we can give them to her tomorrow. Good idea. Well, the cat's the main thing. OK. Feed the cat. We ought to leave her the vet's details as well, just in case there's a problem. Yes. Have you got them handy? Hang on. I'm just looking. Yes. His name's Colin Jeffrey. Is that spelt with a G? Actually, it's J E double F E R E Y. Quite an unusual spelling, isn't it? Hmm. And his number? O treble seven five nine four one two eight. It's a mobile. Okay. And you should write down where it is. It's Four Street. Not sure what number, but it's next to the bus stop, isn't it? It's not a very good landmark, but it's on the other side of the road to the church, so I'll tell her that. Uh, let's hope she won't need a vet anyway. <laughs> yes. Right, apart from that, there are the plants to water. Ask her to make sure they don't dry out. Oh, yes. 
And I've already mentioned the problem with the boiler, and your mum said she'd come round to meet the heating engineer and let him in. Yes, it's a lot for her to do, but we really need to get the problem sorted out. And the earliest date I could get an appointment was April the 30th. Isn't it the day after we go? Yes, we leave on the 29th, and she'll have to hang around till the job's finished. Oh, well, she won't mind, I'm sure. She likes helping people out. Yes, she does. OK. That's it then, I think. Unless you can think of anything else. Not at the moment. Leave the list there and I'll add to it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear some information about a medical museum in London called the Hunterian Museum, which is part of the Royal College of Surgeons. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening. I'm here to tell you about the Hunterian Museum in London, which is part of the Royal College of Surgeons. Although a medical museum, it is open to the general public. The museum specialises in the history of the study of anatomy, and especially the work of John Hunter, in the 18th century. If you would like a free guided tour of the museum, then come along at one o'clock any Wednesday. Spaces on the tour are limited to 25, though, so it's best to reserve a place by phone, and these tours are for individual members of the public, families, and small groups of friends only. Tours for groups of school students can also be arranged, and these are also free of charge. Teachers are encouraged to make a donation of around £3 per student if they can afford it, but this isn't obligatory. What teachers must do, however, is phone to agree a time in advance, as only one school party is allowed in at a time. Then there's an online booking form which you can use to confirm the booking. Or just send a letter if you prefer. For older students and adult groups, we provide more specialised tours, and these cost £100 for a short tour of 30 minutes, or if you want a slightly longer one, it's £130 for 45 minutes. There is a student discount, however, so college groups would pay £75 for the shorter tour, for example. In terms of facilities available at the museum, teachers and others should bear in mind that space is very limited. As we're in the centre of London, with many cafes and restaurants nearby, refreshments aren't sold on site though there is a small shop selling souvenirs. Most of the things on show in the museum are preserved animal specimens in glass cases, so there are no interactive displays aimed at small children. And our tours are only in English, although there is printed material available in other major languages on request. There's also a lecture room, 
which groups can book for an extra charge, and this is equipped with PowerPoint projector and microscopes. Before you hear the rest of the presentation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Next, a bit about the history of the museum and the preserved animal and plant specimens you can see there. The museum's named after John Hunter, who was a pioneer in the study of anatomy. He was among the first to understand that the study of other animals could tell us a lot about how the human body works. John Hunter was born in 1728 and came to London to work as an assistant in an anatomy school in 1748. Here John did his training in the study of human anatomy. It was after 1760, however, that he turned his attention to animals. That's when he became a surgeon in the army, spending three years in France and Portugal, where he started collecting and preserving animal specimens, such as lizards. On his return to London in 1763, Hunter set up in private practice and started to build up his collection of specimens. When he moved to a big house in Leicester Square in 1783, Hunter started to take in resident students and gave the name Teaching Museum to his collection. By the time of his death in 1793, Hunter had collected specimens from all over the world, including the first kangaroo to be seen outside Australia. He had 14,000 different exhibits, with 500 species of plants and animals represented. And many of these specimens can still be seen in the museum today, because in 1799 the collection was purchased by the government, who presented it to the Royal College of Surgeons. And they've been looking after it ever since, which is why the Hunterian Museum is located in their building in London to this day. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part two. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students and a tutor. They are talking about essays. First, look at questions 21 to 25. As you listen, answer the questions. So, Pamela, here's your essay. And, Carl, you've already got yours back. Anything you want to ask or any comments? 
Can you just go over again for us how the marks for our essays go towards our final grade? Well, um, over the year, you're meant to write five main essays for this course. Yes. And each essay is marked out of twenty, which gives you a total of one hundred marks. Yes. This coursework makes up fifty percent of your marks for the year, with the other fifty percent coming from the written exam. Right. So the five essays contribute to fifty percent of our final grade for the year. Yes. Mm, you gave me eighteen out of twenty for this essay, which gives me a total of nine percent towards my final grade for the year. Hmm. And I want. And to... with fourteen for this one, I've got seven percent. Yes, Pamela. Does that clarify it? Yes.、Mm, yes. We did have it explained to us at the beginning of the course. When? In the first tutorial. Okay. I think we'd better move on now. About your last essay, have either of you any questions or comments? Before the conversation continues, look at questions twenty-six to thirty. As you listen to the next part of the talk, complete the table. You gave me eighteen for this paper. What was the big difference between this piece and the previous one? I actually thought the first one was better. Well, there was quite a marked difference. Really? Yes. It looked as if you had actually done quite a bit of research. You had quite a lot of relevant examples, especially on the historical side. You even found some information that I was not even aware of. Your sources were also very sound, and on top of that, your answer was very well organised indeed, and the writing style was very elegant. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. I must say that it was the best piece of writing for a paper that we've seen for quite some time. I have to say, though, it took me a very long time to put it together. How long? At least two weeks. But it was well worth it. Can I just ask you if it's possible to rewrite the first essay of the term? It's really brought my average down. I'm sorry, but it's impossible. Is there no way to do it? I'm afraid not. Okay, right. I'll just have to try to do better than average on the others. And Pamela? Well. To be honest, on the whole, I'm happy with my marks. Again, your research was very good, and you gave quite a long list of source material, which was very good. I spent quite a lot of time on this essay, more than the others. Well, again, it shows. What about the organisation? I was a bit worried about that. Your organisation, I have to say, was excellent. Oh, but as regards your style, yes. It is slightly too informal here and there.、Mm. I think you need to tighten this up a little.、Mm, okay. I only wish I'd put a bit more effort into the first one as well now. But I would like to know how I can get my marks up even higher. What do I have to do specifically? Well, your work could do with being more thoroughly checked. You have quite a few spelling mistakes. Yes, I know. If it's anything, I think it's the computer. Hmm. Well, I'm not very good at typing, two fingers really, and when I finish something like this, I find it difficult, even depressing, to go over it carefully again. But it's affecting your marks.、Mm. Your previous essay was much better than this one. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult to follow what's being said because of the frequency of mistakes. A couple of years ago, the university authorities would have been more lenient, but now they're very hot on presentation, and have been coming down heavily on things like grammar and spelling.、Mm. In fact, I am obliged to deduct marks from every piece of work which is not handed in fairly free of mistakes.
That is the end of part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on the writer Charles Dickens, given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, look at questions 31 to 35. Note the example that has been done for you. As you listen to the first part of the talk, tick the appropriate box for questions 31 to 35. Good morning. My name is Professor Sarah Lennon, and I'm here today to talk to you about the works of one of the greatest writers in the English language, Charles Dickens. He wrote many books, and if we bear in mind that there are over 2,000 characters in his stories, we can get an idea of the complexity of his work. I've selected one novel from your reading list that I would like to talk about to illustrate his genius, namely Dombey and Son. But before we look at this work in earnest, I thought it might be a good idea to have a quick look at his life, and also at a few of the major events that happened during his lifetime, so that we can try to put his writing into perspective. Dickens was born on the 7th of February, 1812, at the time when his father was working in Portsmouth Dockyard. His father was transferred to London in 1814. To help give us a picture of the time Dickens was born into, it's worth noting that in 1814, when Dickens was two, the first efficient steam locomotive was constructed in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Then, in 1817, the year that Queen Victoria was born and Waterloo Bridge in London was opened, the Dickens family moved away from London. And to give Dickens' life a literary perspective, in the following year... Works by other famous English writers were published. Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey and Persuasion, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Scott's The Heart of Midlothian. When Dickens was almost ten, his family circumstances changed and in 1822 the family moved back to London. In 1824, John Dickens was arrested for debt and imprisoned in the Marshalsea, near London Bridge, in London. This event had a profound effect on Dickens' writing. From 1827, Charles Dickens had various jobs as solicitor's clerk, freelance reporter and newspaper reporter. Before the speaker continues the talk, look at questions 36 to 40. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. For questions 36 and 37, circle the correct answer. For questions 38 to 40, 
for each answer. In December 1833, Dickens had his first story, A Dinner at Poplar Wall, published in The Monthly Magazine. In the same year, the SS Royal William became the first vessel to cross the Atlantic Ocean by steam alone. In 1836, two important events happened. Dickens published the first series of sketches by Boz, and the publishers, Chapman and Hall, suggested his first novel, The Pickwick Papers. In April of the same year, the second major event took place. Dickens married Catherine Hogarth. And in 1837, the year that Queen Victoria became Queen of England and Samuel B. Morse developed Telegraph, the novel Oliver Twist began publication in Bentley's Miscellany in 24 monthly instalments. You may not be aware that serialisation like this was common in Dickens' time. In the subsequent year, that is in 1838, the serialisation of Nicholas Nickleby started and appeared in 20 instalments. Dickens' novel The Old Curiosity Shop began serialisation in 1840. This was the year the first postage stamp, the Penny Post, was brought in by Rowland Hill, and the year the first bicycle was produced. The next major publication for Dickens was in 1842, when the first part of Martin Chuzzlewit appeared, and in 1848, Dombey and Son was published. Now, uh, do you have any questions before we go on to look at this work in some depth? No? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.